Hi, I'm Barrett Wessel, a PhD candidate in the Department of Environmental Science and Technology at the University of Maryland, working with Marty Rabenhorst. And I'm here to tell you about Coastal Zone Soil Survey, a pedologic frontier. In order to get into this, I'm going to go through some of my own research on Road River, which is a sub-estuary on the western shore of Chesapeake Bay. It's about 1,000 acres in area, and we've conducted a subaqueous soil survey there. There is an existing sediment map, which you see here, but it's not really suitable for re recent aquaculture programs in the state. It divides materials into only four types, mud, sand, a mud-sand complex, and shell reef, and doesn't provide much more information than that. And the aquaculture program allows people to lease areas of bay bottom to work that by putting down shell and baby oysters, uh, colch and spat, and to have the exclusive right to harvest from that area. And so it's important to know what the soil characteristics are there to understand what sorts of management you'll have to use. And so the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, which is where that star is on the map, was interested in producing a higher quality map here and potentially applying the concepts elsewhere. So we proposed to delineate landforms from bathymetric maps, to select transects and transverts that describe uh, the changes throughout the landscape by describing soil cores along those, and to develop pedogenic models for Chesapeake Bay that we can apply elsewhere. We started with point data from 1933 and 1972 and added some of our own from 2015. We produced contour maps and digital elevation models, which you see here. The red dots on the digital elevation model are some of our sampling points. But look for a moment at the contour map, and you can see a lot of landscape complexity in here. You have this shelf that runs along the edge of much of the Road River. It has, in most places, a sharp slope. Uh, as it transitions into this deep water cove or central channel environment. And so there's a lot of complexity here that isn't captured in the current water map unit. So from that, we delineated 11 different landform types using adjacent landforms such as cliffs or wetlands. We looked at water depth, the 3D shape of the landforms, and the slope and aspect. Aspect is important here because of fetch, which is the distance that wind can blow across water to build up wave energy before it crashes into some landform. We took cores using conventional methods. Here you see our Macaulay peat auger, which collects half cores from soft, muddy materials and organic soil. You see a sample laid out on a table from a traditional bucket auger. And you see here our Viber core, which is uh, used by attaching a concrete vibrator that's used to shake the bubbles out of freshly poured concrete to the top of a piece of aluminum irrigation pipe lowering this through a hatch in the boat and turning on the vibrator. Vibrations travel through the pipe and liquefy material at the tip as long as it's saturated and unconsolidated. And you can get a core two or four metal meters into the right kind of material in just a minute or two with this. It's very effective. We performed a variety of data analyses on these cores. We did horizonation via any differences that we could see or feel or smell. We recorded them on cell colors, the odor, looking for hydrogen sulfide or petroleum, field textures. In the lab, we did particle size analysis and electrical conductivity. We recorded fluidity, which is when you take a handful of the material and squeeze it. And if most or all of it flows through your fingers, then it's moderately or highly fluid material. We did moist aerobic incubations. You measure the pH of a sample and you allow it to oxidize over time, uh, 8 to 16 weeks, measuring the pH occasionally as you go along. Reduced sulfur compounds will form sulfuric acid as they oxidize. This can react with carbonates and other things, but it gives you an integrated measure of what happens to these samples if they're exposed or disturbed and allowed to oxidize. And we classified materials as either hypersulfitic, where the pH drops below 4, or hyposulfitic, where the pH drops but stays above 4. And that's used in the Australian Soil Classification System and the WRB, has not yet been adopted in the U.S. soil taxonomy. And we described redox features, which is where we ran into a little bit of a surprise. And so I'm going to take you through sort of an idealized transvert through the landscape, starting up in the top with the submerged and buried marsh surface soils. Each one of these slides is going to have one of these plots of pH data, where we have pH on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis, and the material types here. You can pause the video and take a look at this more carefully if you like. So up here with the buried marsh surface soils, which are usually next to tidal marshes, we find sapric sulfiwacysts, that is organic soils, subaqueous soils, uh, that are highly decomposed and that produce a lot of sulfuric acid, 
when they're allowed to oxidize. Or we find thaptohistic subgroups of other soils, that is, they contain buried O horizons. These represent sequences of marsh accretion. They're very complex profiles. They represent sea level changes, discontinuities, and they tend to be hypersulfitic in and around any buried A and O horizons due to that high organic matter content. Moving into the main part of the Road River, we have submerged wave cut platform soils, which are what we find along that sort of shelf that we saw in the contour data. We find typic fluviwasense here or eric fluviwasense. Uh, those names don't really describe what we see here because we have these thick scour lag deposits, sometimes rather thin actually, that tend to be sandy, over paleosols, which uh, can be sands or sandy clays. We have, in many cases, uh, an abrupt boundary here at the discontinuity. And if you continue going deeper, you get into an unoxidized zone of black materials that resemble uh, marine sediment parent materials. But the reason we think that this reddish brown material here in the lower part of this horizon is a former upland paleosol is because we have these colors. We have all of these iron oxides that have formed, and in particular, we have this pale yellow mineral, jarosite, that only forms at a very low pH in an oxidizing environment. And so that's likely to have formed during a period of exposure. There's really not much of another explanation for it. Then we have the wave-built terrace soils moving into slightly deeper water. Just off the edge of the wave-cut platform, we have a submerged wave-built terrace. And this is sandy and coarse material that is cut from the shore as sea level rises, as waves beat the shore. They wash the fines out, and they carry the sands and the coarse materials into just deep enough water where they can deposit. And so they build up a part of that shelf and the slope that slopes rather abruptly down into the rest of the landscape. And so here we have fluventic or sulfic samowasens or sulfic fluviwasens. These are non-fluid sands and loamy sands. They're hyposulfitic and maybe hypersulfitic in and around buried A and O horizons. And then in the deeper water, in the coves and the central channel, and the tidal creeks, if it's deep enough up in those, we have estuarine channel and tidal creek soils. These are grossic hydrowasens. They're subaqueous soils. The hydro means they're moderately to highly fluid, and grossic means that that material is thick. For classification purposes, we only need a meter of it, but the deepest we've gone in some of these is five meters, and we haven't gotten to the bottom of this type of material in some areas. And so it is quite a thick deposit. Again, it's moderately to highly fluid. Uh, these are silty clays and silty clay loams in the Road River, and they acidify, but they're not hypersulfitic. Take a look at that pH diagram. And so with all of that, we can assemble this 30 million year story that represents the soil landscape model, moving from A to F. And so 30 million years ago, we have the formation of the tertiary Aquia and Natchamoy geologic formations in marine environments. This is submerged material, the green rec represents glauconite, and the black is pyrite accumulation. As time passed, water got deeper, and Miocene deposits and Quaternary deposits were deposited on top of this. Between B and C, Sea level changed many times, rose and fell, rose and fell, and there may have been many periods of erosion and deposition. But ultimately, we end up at sea, where sea levels are lower, and they've exposed much of the Natchamoy in the subaerial environment, and we have these brown colors forming in this oxidized tertiary material. As an oxidation front moves down, and you can see that represented here, below which we have the glauconitic green material that still contains pyrite. This supported plants and had an ordinary subaerial A horizon at the top. Moving on to D, at the end of the last glaciation, sea levels began to rise again, and this is where we have the formation of our landforms. Wave energy truncated the profiles. We have a, a cutting down through this oxidized tertiary material, and the sand moved off and began to form our submerged wave cut terrace. Moving from D to E, sea level rises further. This process continues as the water moves inland, Sandy material can be deposited over top our oxidized tertiary material. We have a subaqueous A horizon, which contains monosulfitic materials or metastable iron sulfides, depending on who you ask. And in the deeper water, we have the accumulation of these fine silty materials, the grossic hydrowasins. And then moving on to F, we have what we have today. One, two, and three here at the top uh, represent sort of our submerged wave cut platform, where now we have some glaying moving down as these uh, iron oxides are reduced and removed. We have a thick 
uh, wave built terrace, and we have a thick, fine, silty deposit in the deeper water. And in fact, we see that along this inset here, one, two, and three, moving through the edge of one of our mainland coves. And so with that, we can develop our soil map units. We developed seven new soil series that we proposed, 15 map units, and 57 delineations. The map units here are named for the dominant soil series, that's the first two letters, and a depth phase, which is the third letter. And the depth phase is particularly useful in the subaqueous environment. And so in conclusion, subaqueous soils in the Rode River do correlate well with landform position, which is a continuation of the pedologic concepts that have been developed over the past century or so. It's no different. As long as you understand the soil forming factors, then if you map the landscape, you can map the soils and do a little ground truthing to check as you go along. And that's our next step is to test this in an adjacent sub-estuary. So subaqueous soil maps provide valuable guidance to inform site selection, on-site evaluations, and land management decisions for aquaculturists and others. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all these folks that were very helpful in making this happen, and in particular the NRCS, the NSF, and the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center for funding portions of this work.